Hello and welcome to today's Environment and Energy Leader webinar sponsored by Montrose Environmental Group, an environmental services company. My name is Jessica Hunt and on behalf of the entire team at e, &E Leader, I welcome you to the present and future of real-time air monitoring. Questions specific to the presentation as well as any technical questions may be submitted through the Q&A chat widget, which is already opened on your screen. We just ask that before sending questions regarding video and sound, that you check your system utilizing the help widget at the bottom of your console. Please feel free to communicate with other participants as some have already started doing using the attendee chat feature. Let us know why you are joining us today and where you are joining us from. During today's event, attendees will have the opportunity to hear perspectives from subject matter experts in relation to air quality monitoring. This thought leadership discussion will be interactive and attendees have the opportunity to submit questions for all presenters over the next 40 minutes or so. Please submit using the Q&A widget as well. And if we do not get a chance to answer your specific question during the live broadcast, a member of the team will follow up with you as soon as possible. And just a reminder, like all of our events at e, e Leader, this will be available on demand later this afternoon. And if you are watching this on demand, please still feel free to submit questions because all of the questions that you submit post live event will also be forwarded on to the team at Montrose. Additionally, e, e Leader will be providing a certificate of attendance for all attendees who meet the specific viewing criteria. And at this point, you've heard enough from me, and I'm going to turn the event over to Pat. Uh, thank you, Jess. Uh, my name is Patrick Clark. I'm the vice president in the environmental data platform group at Montrose Air Quality Services. Um, my primary focus is on air quality monitoring and measurement. Uh, I've been in the field of air quality measurement for uh, pretty much my entire career. Uh, I'm super excited about the discussions today because really we've seen in the last five years this transformation in the space of air quality monitoring and measurement. We've seen everything from really low cost sensors that can be placed in communities to mobile platforms that can analyze for hundreds of different compounds. So real exciting time, at least for me. Um, I have an example of how this new generation of air quality monitoring can be impactful. Uh, and this example takes place in Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia runs an air quality monitoring network. It consists of 10 different monitoring stations, highly sophisticated, very expensive equipment. Uh, it's intended to generate a very high quality data, uh, partially to meet the requirements of the national ambient air quality standards. So on June 21st, 2019, there was an explosion at a, the Philadelphia refinery. Um, by all accounts, it was described as a massive explosion, large fire. Community members were told to shelter in place. Uh, there were community members that went to the ER with smoke issues. It took a day to put the fire out. Satellites picked up the heat signature of the fire. It was that big. So if you looked at the air quality data from the city of Philadelphia air quality network, uh, they saw nothing. It was basically looked like a normal summer day in Philadelphia. And that's because the plume and every all the effects of the fire missed all the ambient air quality stations. So what we've seen now is that we can measure air quality in a very hyper local level. Um, and we're developing these networks that can detect not only something as large as a a fire and explosion, but even small fugitive leaks. Uh, but all this is very much still in the early stages of development. So with that, I'd like to introduce our three panelists. Um, first, we have Mer Meredith Knopf. Uh, she is a environmental health safety supervisor at PD PDC Energy here in Colorado. Uh, they're an exploration and production company. Uh, prior to PDC, she worked with a consultant primarily focused on oil and gas and also another oil and gas company. We also have Michael Ogletree. He's the director of the Air Pollution Control Division for the state of Colorado. Uh, before being with the state of Colorado, he's with the city and county of Denver. 
and he was the creator of the Love My Air program, uh, which started out by putting uh, particulate sensors in in schools. Uh, little known fact about Michael, he's actually, uh, prior to this, he was a Division One soccer player and actually a professional soccer player for a short period. Uh, and last but not least, Matt Beach, he's the Vice President of Software Solutions for Montrose Environmental. Uh, prior to coming on board with Montrose, he was the owner of a company called Sensible IoT, a software company that, amongst other things, was an enterprise solution for air quality data management. Um, so with those introductions, if it's all right, I'm going to get the questions going. Michael, can you hear us okay? Yep. I'm going to take that as a yes. Um, first question for Meredith, but really for everybody. Um, you know, air quality data has become more and more actionable, uh, meaning alerts can be sent out when air quality exceeds thir certain thresholds. Um, just curious how this has played out at PDC in terms of, of these alerts, how has it affected uh, operations, those types of things. Sure. And thanks for having me today. Um, we, most of our operations are in Colorado, so we're actually under a rule, Regulation 7, that requires air monitors at all our new sites that are being drilled um, since 2021. So we actually are required by law to receive alerts and uh, respond to them within a certain time frame. And how we've done that is a couple things. We actually work with um, Montrose and um, have set up a uh, monitoring stations around each of our facilities that are applicable. And we actually receive alerts two ways. We receive them via email and uh, via text. And we actually have a couple people that um, check that regularly, including our third party contractor. But we also have um, a field monitoring room that is manned 24 seven. They are actually, we're now in the process of getting them to receive the alerts as well. And then we also have an on-call system so we can work with our foreman and um, surface maintenance team as well as our EHS on call to make sure we respond to that within the required time frame. So it's definitely a multifaceted approach. We try to, especially when we're unsure of what's going on, to respond as quickly as possible to at least eliminate the issue, which again is it's pretty rare. We don't receive a lot of alerts um, to make sure that we can uh, identify and then correct the, the issue as, as we need to. Yeah, Meredith, I'm curious, do you see a lot of false positive alerts where you, we send you an alert and you go out and you can't find anything? Yeah, um, mostly, almost all the false positives are related to weather. In fact, we just had a pretty nasty storm go through um, our area of operations up in northeastern Colorado in the Greeley area, big, big chunks of hail. Um, and when we get those severe weather events, we do have a tendency for monitors to fail. And we did have one of those last night. We still send out a team, um, even though the readings usually can demonstrate pretty accurately that something's amiss, not always. And they go out and usually they can find the monitors either on the ground or waterlogged or they fail their calibration, meaning they were damaged. So that's probably the most alerts we get is actually related to, to the weather. Um, and this time of year, we, we seem to get a lot more of those just because it's stormy. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you. Um, you know, Michael, I'm curious, kind of the, the ability to send out alerts um, and then, you know, look for leaks or events in real time. You know, do you see this in future regulations? Um, how do you see this from your perspective? Yeah, you know, I think for us, uh, we do uh, use some of that information and data in regulations currently. As Meredith mentioned, regulation number seven was updated to require the use of real-time monitoring. Um, and then requiring the facilities to put together um, action plans based on thresholds so that um, they can show through, um, through reporting that they are addressing those leaks in a timely fashion. And what we've seen in the data um, is that it is being successful. Uh, the program um, was passed, I believe in late 2021, it was um, required to go into action May, um, sorry, 2020 uh, and went into action May uh, 1st of 2021. Yep. Yeah, so we have uh, a little almost close to two years um, and we've been analyzing some of that data and we are showing, um, you know, good um, response times from um, those using those systems. So, Michael, um, 
question for you. So did you set the threat? Did the state of Colorado set the threshold? How is um, that so determined? Way, yeah, so the way it's done, the way the rule was passed, um, there's a 10 day baseline that's collected prior to um, the monitoring, well, prior to the production starting or any of the pre-production activities. So we have a baseline and then using that baseline, the each individual source will set its own threshold um, for which uh, they would then take action. Um, and all of those reports, or sorry, all of those plans are reviewed and approved by the division. Yeah, and I can follow up on that. Um, we submit plans to the division um, that need to be approved prior to implementation at all our locations. And PDC actually, there's, I guess, different ways. You can use um, VOCs or methane. So you create a trigger threshold based on that. And we use the, the health guidelines value for benzene to kind of back calculate and determine a, a health threshold that way. But there are different methodologies depending on the type of sensor and then um, approval, but the division approves all of them. So they're all approved through them. Gotcha. So Meredith, if I'm understanding you correct, then you use total VOCs as somewhat of a surrogate for benzene and then use the benzene health guideline value to back calculate a total VOC threshold and alert based on that. Yeah, and that's based on our own um, our own uh, gas analyses as well too. And so we, uh, and you know, we collect as part of the rule, which is um, this benzene sorbit tubes, which are very similar to what you saw in the refinery fence line rule as well. And we collect those on a two week cadence as well, unless a, a threshold is triggered and then we collect those immediately and put a new one out. And those are um, also have their own benzene threshold that if we were to exceed that in the data collection, we would also notify the division as well. Yeah, that makes sense. So Matt, follow up question for you. Um, you know, we're sending out alerts, uh, assuming email, text, most common, but in terms on the software side and being able to alert in real time um, you know, beyond alerting when a pollutant value exceeds a certain threshold, you know, what other types of things are you working on? Yeah, thanks, Pat. I think it's important when talking about alerts, and I could probably do a full hour webinar just on different types of alerts and different functionality of alerts. But really, there's the regulatory driven alerts, and then there's the community based alerts. And some of those actually are starting to integrate with each other. So regulatory is driving community-based alerts. So when we're talking about regulatory alerts, some of the more creative and um, uh, things that we've seen and we're starting to do is really um, getting feedback. So targeting alerts to the right operations people, making sure they're getting actionable data in those alerts. Sometimes it's not just the value, but trends or weather data or weather patterns as part of those alerts. And then, you know, the second component where we see a lot of integration, as Meredith was talking about, is how do you integrate in these into these operation centers of these companies so that not only are we sending alerts, but those alerts are going through their standard procedures to be actionable and make sure that um, they're real alerts. So how can we combine stuff like weather as part of those to help predict events. And then also I mentioned um, feedback loops. So um, some like the app now for the community can receive feedback. You can ask the community question, was this alert helpful? And then we can base uh, you know future improvements to those alerts based on their feedback. Um, and so that's yeah, really where we're targeting those alerts at the moment and some of the ability. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Appreciate that. You know, another question, and I'll start with you, Meredith, if that's okay. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the last five years, new sensors, new technology being developed all the time, being implemented in ways we've never done it before. A lot of it, not per a specific regulation per se, where there's you know, traditionally you monitor, there's a limit, you exceed it, it's an exceedance, um, but it's community groups, NGOs, uh, all sorts of data being collected and quality control, quality assurance um, is still, I think, being developed. Do you have concerns, like, you know, just about data being collected around some of your facilities and the, the quality of that data? 
I mean, there's different monitors used for different purposes, and I think understanding the monitor or the piece of equipment that is being used to collect the data is is pretty impactful. Like, we've definitely piloted, we kind of have a little uh, pilot program where we're piloting other monitors um, that are not required by Regulation 7. Um, and what we found is some of them are really great. Um, they function as a smoke detector. They'll let you know something is there. Um, their quantification is often um, maybe not as good. So maybe some of the um, monitors that are used by community organizations could potentially fall in that category. Now, we've also got a lot of other um, other kind of monitoring happening in our basins and areas where we operate. There's flyovers, there's satellite. Um, the CDPHE has their own monitoring device that we've partnered with them as well. And so, and then we, we also understand the detection limits and the accuracy of those as well. And understanding that um, there's a lot of new technology in this space. And so there, there could be the potential for people to not understand that. Um, I know MeTech, which is a kind of like a the place to go to test out your monitors here in Colorado is a great place for people to take monitors and test them and kind of get that stamp. So there's, it's complicated. I mean, there's no easy real answer to that, but definitely understanding the monitor and how it can be used. Um, I think there is a little bit of confusion. Not all um, quantification tools are the same and some tend to great, greatly overestimate emissions and some can underestimate emissions. Some detection limits aren't low enough to even read the emissions. So just knowing that is, is, is super powerful. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, Michael, from your perspective, you know, we want to encourage um, development of technologies, but we also want to collect quality data um, kind of from a regu regulatory viewpoint. You know, your thoughts on quality QAQC with a lot of the new technologies that are being deployed and collecting data as we speak. Yeah, you know, um, to Meredith's point, you know, I think data and data quality is of the utmost importance so that you have a better understanding of what you can and can use that data set for. I think all data sets are valuable. Um, it's just how you uh, implement them or use the information that they produce. Um, and, and really figuring out how to best use that information. So with some of the total VOC sensors, we do have co-locations with some of our reference sites, um, either because uh, they collect higher, faster resolution data that we can use as indicators, um, or just to you know, validate you know, other things that are going on in the area. Um, you know, it's some of these low cost sensors and total VOC sensors are really valuable to be able to um, monitor in much more areas um, and really focus, um, you know, the more advanced technology um, when we do see a spike in a specific area while still keeping a pulse as to what's going on across a larger region. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, and, and I'm curious, Matt, you know, um, we, when you think of air quality monitoring, quality assurance, quality control, you think of calibrating equipment, um, you don't think of software kind of on the software side, managing these networks, you know, what kind of things can we do using software to assure data quality? Well, I think as one of the components Michael was talking about is the ability to, with the lower cost sensors is really deploy m more sensors. And what happens when you have more sensors out in the network, you start understanding patterns of sensors and manufacturers and so making sure you can trend on when a, when a particular sensor or sensor technology might be trending in um, poor quality of data, you can see that through knowing your network. And what was, what's interesting is uh, when you look at a, a, a network like, let's say, uh, the Denver network that Michael started years ago, and we've been working as partners on that, you can really tell by having all these sensors out pretty quick when one is misbehaving just by the way the others are behaving. So that's one small way to start seeing that data and trending it and improving the data quality. But it, data quality also goes back to, um, you know, one of the first things we talked about is alerts, making sure you're getting actionable alerts, not just on values of concentration, but also if something's going on, the sensor's down, the sensor values might be sticking, and there's other quality assurances process that the software can see 
because it's expecting data, it's looking at data. Traditionally, you know, 10 years ago, these equipment had self uh, alerting. So they would send out alerts themselves. But now, because all the data is coming into one place, you can see it, you can see what's happening, you can see those trends. Is this something local or is this something vast across the network? And then kind of predict what's going on with those sensors. And so making sure the data in it coming in is good when you have all that data to compare to, you can make sure that that quality of the network data is is improved. Yeah, the, that makes sense. Um, you know, I was wondering if we could uh, check out the first poll question, maybe take a one minute break from questions to the panel and, and take a look at our first one. Have recent regulatory requirements impacted your decision making around real time monitoring? So I think the Kind of point of this question, obviously, regulatory requirements, we're seeing things coming from states, from EPA. Um, if you're in California, the local air districts, um, a lot of this is transitioned from more traditional tubes and canisters and that type of monitoring to real time. So if, uh, yeah, if everybody could respond to this, I don't know how quickly we get the poll results. Could we take a look at those? I'm curious. All right, so a little over half will have uh, be making decisions around real time monitoring, which which is a lot. And I think that's where you know as we transition uh, in terms of air quality measurement, the transition is going to be away from the you know tubes canisters approach to real time monitoring. So with that, I'm going to dive back into the questions. Um, you know, one that's come up for us a few times is data security. Um, you know, in the past, you know, data would be collected by hardware, be stored locally, we'd process that data, make a report, but now data is going from sensors via cell networks to the cloud. Um, in some cases, it could be going to a third party hardware company, then going to the environmental platform. So operators, you know, their data is is out there. Um, so Meredith, I was wondering, you know, for PDC, um, have there been concerns about data security? Not as much, kind of where you guys at on that? Um, we're always concerned about data security. You know, a lot of our data eventually becomes public. Um, we have to submit it to various state agencies, but until then, they can sometimes be considered confidential business information, um, could lead to, you know, insider trading type stuff. Um, there's also personal information on some of that. So PDC works very hard on our own internal data security. And then when we partner with third party vendors, we also work with them to make sure that there's secure sign-on. Um, we usually negotiate MSAs, so we have a better understanding of site security. Whenever we start to evaluate these types of things, we do a full business impact analysis as well. And again, you know, I mean, to Michael's point, he has all our data for air monitoring. He gets them on a monthly basis. But um, so it's not, it, you know, in, in this specific example, you know, that comes to them every month. But still we'd like to keep that secure until we can um, download it and send it just because there could be potential for abuse you know you can always uh, hack into data and then ch cherry pick the information you want without the background information so security is always forefront on our mind as a as an oil and gas company no, and, and and so no that makes sense you know matt you know, from your perspective, um, you're the software guy, what, what's, you know, what steps to ensure, uh, you know, data can't be hacked into and used, you know, in a nefarious way? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that it's, again, it's probably an, a whole nother webinar that will bore people to tears. So I won't get into the details, but most companies um, we work with have their data security requirements pretty defined. So we get to work inside of those frameworks. And those are standard ISO NIST frameworks that the government and agencies put out and they have very specific um, data uh, security requirements. And um, even one that people don't think about that does impact this is sometimes even the HIPAA, the health information, because 
we're seeing the you know the increased use of mobile monitoring handhelds and and vans and cars and so that has geolocation data trending so how do we protect that data is very important and you know data encryption data authentication is important and then audible how do you make sure that the data you're reporting is what you receive and so we have multi layers of security to make sure that the data we see we we receive cannot be um, changed and it's stored off in different locations and that way we always have a trail of exactly how that data came through the system where where it went through and how it got reported out one extra um a uh, little piece inside of our software that we do is every time you request data is it checks to make sure that user has access to that particular data point not just that uh, sensor or that uh, organization it goes all the way down to a data level and then we provide our clients with exactly who has access to that data so even mantras where we might be doing maintenance on multiple different organizations, our users have to go and authenticate to that organization. They cannot be authenticated to multiple organizations at the same time, ensuring data quality, data parity for those um, those those organizations. So it's it's always evolving. There's always new standards coming out. So being um, up to date on those and making sure you're taking those steps are important. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I appreciate that. You know, uh, Michael, I have a question for you and I'm not putting you on the spot here, but, um, you know, again, back in the day, you know, reports were submitted hard copies. You know, we've advanced to electronic report submittal via PDF. Um, but obviously we're collecting all this data in real time electronically. You know, it, it seems like we'll get to a point where data is flowing electronically and then we're able to amass all that data to make informed decisions. I imagine that's on your mind knowing you. Um, could you just kind of speak to that from your perspective? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're going through a big, a pretty big transformation here at the Air Division. Um, you know, we do have antiquated systems that, um, you know, through some significant funding from the legislature um, in 2022, we are, you know, modernizing our backend data infrastructure and connecting all the previously de-siloed data sets, as well as switching to um, more uh, automated systems that are no longer paper-based. Um, you know, it'll take some time for us to get there, but, you know, I think as we see a lot more data being collected around the state of Colorado, um, we're looking at ways to bring that data in um, into one space to be able to make informed decisions quicker. Um, there are events that occur across the state where we need to be able to look at different data sets. Um, and right now we're visiting several different sites. Um, and once we have all of the real-time data in one place, it makes our response as the local public health agency um, much quicker. So having access to more real-time data um, from different data networks all in the same place is really something we're, we're looking to implement in the shorter term um, because it is important and we are seeing as we're doing more monitoring across the state we are seeing um, additional events and want to make sure we can be responsive so you know examples i mean there's a lot of data being collected everywhere so some of these networks colorado rugs reg seven real-time monitors like what other data do you envision bringing in to a database at, at some point? Yeah, so there's um, you know other research monitoring that's going going um, going on uh, or along the front range. Um, there's other uh, federal grants that are providing funding to different community groups. You know, ARP recently um, or through ARP uh, funds, the EPA awarded it to I believe six different entities across the state of Colorado. Um, there's community groups down in Pueblo and other areas collecting all of this data. There's people putting up purple airs in their backyards. Um, some cities are doing things like Denver is doing and putting up, you know, their own distributed sensor networks. So in my mind, as we look forward, how do we get all of that data in one place? Um, and part of that is through some kind of standardization, some kind of QA, QC requirements. And it's something we're looking forward to um, 
to doing, um, hopefully within the year, figuring out how we can create a common data standard um, that has uh, QA, QC requirements and indicators so that we know how we can best use each of those data sets to inform decision making. Yeah, that makes sense. Matt, from your perspective, any issues with trying to, it, it seems like a lot, you know, everybody, there's various networks set up all doing things in little different ways to standardize that from a software perspective. Heavy lift, not so bad. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think it's, I think the answer is yes. I think with the regulatory uh, agencies putting out data standard requirements and then from a, a quality standpoint, it's important to make sure that that data is kind of consistent across all data sets. One of the more one of the bigger challenges with that amount of data in those different data sets is what frequency are you monitoring? How many times per minute or per hour? And those can be night and day versus, you know, hourly collecting versus minute collecting. So making sure that the standard, the recording, and then from a data side is really, how are we sending that? What's the standard way we receive it? And what's the standard way we send it to make sure that when these agencies have these databases or, or systems that are consolidating this air quality, everybody's playing at the same level and can get that data to them quickly for them to be able to ingest it. Um, but the vast amount of data is always going to be challenging. We, you know, we, we're doing millions, um, almost 10 million records or, uh, a day in different types of air quality data. So how do you take that, make sure it's, quality data and then package that and put it to this, uh, to the regulatory agencies is always going to be challenging and doing it, you know, cost, making it not cost prohibitive for the organizations to, to share that data. But we are seeing a lot more data sharing out there. Um, and, and, uh, you know, communities are, are monitoring and industries monitoring. So it's an exciting time. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, and you know, and that's just the state of Colorado. Then you think about trying to do that, you know, in the the entire United States, it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be a challenge and a lot of data. Um, you know, let's uh, take a pause and look at the second poll question, if that's okay. And this question is, will you have any air quality monitoring needs in the next three to 12 months? And really this is a question just kind of designed to, you know, is this something in the future for some of you or is it, you know, you're dealing with this now? So if, um, yeah, everybody could answer um, and then we could look at the poll results. Um, this one I'm curious about. All right, maybe we'll get Maybe we'll give everybody a few minutes for this one, and then I'm going to questions, back to questions, and then we could revisit it. Um, I've got a question, and this is relatively new um, developing, and it's for you, Meredith. Um, you know, any oil and gas operator or petrochemical plant has to do periodic leak detection and repair inspections using either uh, optical imaging camera or a um, it's called EPA Method 21 with a sniffer. Um, so Flint Hills Resources was just awarded an alternative means of emission limitation, uh, basically an alternative methodology for um, looking at leaks. Um, and basically in this, what I call an AML, uh, they're using sensors to do 24 seven monitoring uh, for leaks. Um, and if it, goes the way they want it to, it'll, they will not have to do periodic inspections using Method 21 and OGI. So curious, this uh, was granted in February of this year. It's the first one in the country. Um, is that on PDC's radar at all, um, using sensors for in lieu of uh, the periodic inspections? Um. Yes, it's a little different in Colorado. The state actually um, has to approve the vendor for AIM alternative um, emissions monitoring. And I, I believe one has been approved and a second uh, company is pending. And so we have looked at that. It's, it's not quite as 
easy from a logistical standpoint. Flint, Flint Hills is obviously a refinery. Um, we've got about 600 plus oil and gas operations. So when you're having um, continuous, using these continuous emission monitors for leak detection, you have to be prepared and ready um, to have a response team out once those are detected. So we are exploring those for sure. Um, we have not, we have not uh, basically uh, decided to do that. We're still using our OGI cameras. We have about 21 teams that go out. And in Colorado, we actually do monthly monitoring at our larger sites. And no less than, I think we're up to just doing it twice a year voluntarily, just because it's it's uh, at our smaller sites. So it is on my radar. It operates a little bit different in Colorado. Um, and it does take a lot of consideration and time and resources. However, it can be super valuable. And uh, that's why as we start using these sensors more often. We actually also have a camera that can sense leaks as well. And we've had to develop a standard operating procedure for when that camera detects leaks, because it's out there continuous. It's not part of the former LDAR program, but we treat that as an observation, just as if pumper was out there and saw it, or just as if um, one of our camera operators were out there as well. So there's a lot of considerations. And I, I saw a question that says, do you have to monitor for methane as well? And, and for right now in Colorado, the only requirement you know, is, is for methane is a little spurious. I mean, you can use methane as a proxy for a required break seven. We choose to use VOCs because we can attach a health guidance value to it, but I think other companies use it. Um, and, you know, obviously um, the camera can pick up methane. Um, we are oil and gas methane partnership um, signatories, and so we will be required to monitor methane as part of that, but it's a requirement on a voluntary basis to be part of that partnership. Um, so that's kind of my long-winded tangential no. response to that question. <laughs> no, that was good. I was in. Yeah, I wasn't sure how how much on your radar that was. Um, you know, Michael. You know, in terms of the state of Colorado, do you see that as the future, or is it, you know, five, ten years down the road, or kind of what are your thoughts? Nothing monitoring. Now, you know, continuously. Um, we call it a leak detection sensor network, but using sensors that will monitor 24 seven for leaks as opposed to, you know, six month quarterly inspections. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I think it's something as technology evolves, um, it might be something that we, we could potentially consider. Um, technology right now in this space is evolving very quickly and there's all different types of ways to do it, <laughs> um, from direct measurement to, you know, all different kinds, <laughs> um, even calculated emissions based on, you know, flows to a flare, let's say. Um, so I think it's hard to predict when something like that will be more widely adopted, but I think with the rapid advancement of technologies, um, it's something that is definitely something we're looking at. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think we have the question two poll results. If we could go back to those. Yeah, interesting. One third uh, immediate needs, uh, one third not, and a third not sure. So again, this seems seems like a topic that um, if you're not involved in it now and you're in the environmental space, you, you soon will be. Um, question four, I'm going to start with Michael. Um, State of Colorado's invested a fair amount in mobile monitoring platforms, um, so not traditional fixed uh, monitoring. Um, just kind of what do you, you know, can you share your thoughts on mobile monitoring versus fixed monitoring? How's that been working out for the state? Have you, you know, what have you learned? Yeah, um, so uh, we have a couple of different mobile monitoring that we have. Um, they're all named after animals. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, Can you share those camel. animal names, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have a camel, um, which uh, is a community air monitoring mobile lab. Um, we have a, a moose, which is a mobile optical. Oh, uh, I forget what the rest of it is. Um, but we also have a cat, which is a community air toxics. Um, that's also a mobile lab. Then we have an, an emu, which is the emissions measurement unit. Um, so the latter three can actually drive around um, while they're doing um, measurements. Um, 
the camel, you know, actually is uh, looking using the UV DOS to look at plumes, while the cat and the emu are more um, ground-based monitoring. And, and but all four of those are, you know, related to specific projects and, and specific funding. Um, you know, I think with the high resolution mobile monitoring, it's a lot of data, right? We're talking data points every three seconds or less. Um, and so with that high volume of data, you know, I know EPA has created a tool to, to analyze some of that. We're looking to, to try that out, see how it works. Um, but it's just so much data that's being collected and it can be used, um, it can be used in ways to identify um, different potential sources in different areas. We'll see. Um, you know, some of those units are relatively new, and you know, our team's gotten trained on them early, early this year. Um, but they all are specific requirements um, through some of the regulations. But it is going to be an enormous amount of data. Um, so one of the reasons we really need to be careful about how we develop our backend system. Um, we we do have a, a project, um, a project team looking at how we're going to be able to use that and really interested to see like how we use that and in, in the evolution of that monitoring um, and the analysis of it uh, on a mobile platform. Yeah, that, yeah, the amount of data, um, you know, we have our own mobile monitoring platform as well. And the volume of data is, um, it's shocking almost, I guess, Matt, from on your end, um, I mean, are we able to, to ingest that much data um, at high rates of speed, if so, what speed um, for these mobile monitoring platforms in, in real time? Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. The, 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 the more detailed answer of what that looks like is, is depending on the use case. When we talk about mobile monitoring, if, you know, it can be everything from real time monitoring to grabbing the data and trying to give a feedback loop as quick as possible. So near real time, you know, with a couple second lag to a couple minute. Again, when you're getting down to the second data, being able to do real time monitoring mobile all the way back up to the cloud is very difficult just from a data transfer standpoint. So generally the data comes in in chunks every minute to two minutes, gets analyzed and then give um, back to some sort of operator screen. So it's a combination of what's running locally on that monitor and then cloud-based. Um, and it depends because sometimes these mobile monitors are set on kind of a, pre a prescribed path. They just keep doing it over and over. And how many times do you have to go over and over to make that data valuable? Is it six times, seven times? And then, so what you're doing is not only taking that that data and now you're trying to compare it to seven other days of one second data and that's where it becomes challenging making sure that you have the the processing power to do that because those are more operational now there's also events where you're trying to understand where something's coming from and mobile's really advantageous for that so the real-time monitoring and the real-time aspects much more important because you got to drive stop see if you see anything drive stop you know, sometimes it's like a hot, cold game that you used to play as kids, hotter, hotter, cold, cold, come back. And so we try to provide triangulation and source detection in real time on that second data. And the, each one pre presents its own challenges. And some of these have, it's not just one compound every second, it's multiple, it's 20, 30 compounds that you're, you're searching for. So it's a very complex problem and, and we've been doing mobile monitoring. I've personally been part of mobile monitoring for probably six or seven years at, um, at when some of these low cost sensors started coming out um, all the way up to recently where there's vans and community monitors and handhelds is like I talked about before. So we're not just doing one or two vans. We've probably have 10 to 20 different mobile uh, devices out there at any given time collecting data. Uh, you know, another component of that is how do you keep them calibrated? How do you know when you're coming next to a regulatory station, and being able to calibrate to those? So there's a lot of challenges with mobile monitoring, but it's great to see, and it's very useful, very um, specific needs, very good yeah. for specific needs. No, that makes sense. Appreciate that, Matt. 
Um, I'm going to, I have one more question I want to get to for the panel and then we'll do the last poll question and then maybe we'll switch it over to, um, questions from the attendees. Um, this is kind of an easy one. Um, but you know, mostly Meredith and Michael, um, you know, what, with kind of a lot of the community monitoring, fence line monitoring, a lot of things we're doing really are offering or providing us opportunities to educate, um, you know, kids in schools through outreach, community, not only on air quality, but on how your process is run. You know, people, you know, there's a facility, nobody knows really what's going on on the other side of the wall when you're drilling. Um, there could be concerns about air quality and all this sharing of information um, we've really just seen recently. So um, I'll kind of just throw it out to the, the panel, but your thoughts just on, you know, community outreach, community education, um, youth education in terms of both air quality and, and the, you know, processes. You want to go first? Start? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's a lot of what I did in Denver. Right? Um, how do we better educate community, um, different stakeholders on, on what we're doing? Um, so, you know, we're looking to replicate a lot of that work across the state of Colorado in terms of education to communities. And I think really working with those communities. Um, you know, the, the Love My Air program that was developed in Denver was co-developed not only with um, the state and other stakeholders, but also with community. Um, as, as these different community groups come on who are starting to do some of this monitoring, kind of working closely with them to make sure that they're collecting data that is valid, that we can use, and that really meets their end need. Um, I feel a lot of times people are standing up sensor networks or monitoring networks with just the goal of measuring um, and thinking that they could use some of that data further on down the line. But how do we as regulatory agencies work with those groups early on in their projects and provide them um, expertise and resources and give them the ability to collect data that we can then use in, in some kind of um, regulatory space or you know to, to identify potential issues that we could do further follow-up. So I think kind of as we think about what the future looks like in terms of collaboration between regulatory agencies and others doing monitoring, not only industry groups, but also community groups, um, figuring out how to best engage and share some of the expertise and what we've learned um, so that we can have a better understanding and a better relationship with those entities collecting that information and data. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I can, oh, yeah, go ahead, Meredith. And I, I can add to that kind of from an industry perspective. I mean, you know, PDC, we're pretty proud to operate here in Colorado. All, all our employees live and work, um, most of our employees live and work near near a lot of our operating um, well pads. And so we're really proud of the um, work we have done to reduce our emissions here over the last, I mean, since 2014, really, um, and to date, uh, the amount of emissions that our oil and pad sites may it has dramatically reduced and that's part of you know innovation technology um, collaboration with the APCD and the COGCC with new rulemakings um, and so being able to share that information and how we've innovated in just the recent couple years I think is, is pretty exciting for us and we, we welcome that opportunity and I think we also welcome that opportunity to work with the APCD to educate community in in, in the kinds of emissions that that we're seeing at our at our, our locations because I think there, are, there is a fair amount of misinformation out there, and a well operator in Colorado is very different than a well operator potentially in a different state too. And so I think there's 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 a lot of good here in Colorado, and um, we're kind of proud of the work we've done. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that you know when I first started doing this, I didn't realize you know we we never did a lot of community outreach. We didn't engage school kids or community members, and honestly, it's kind of one of the more rewarding. Uh, aspects of the job to be able to have these conversations uh, with the people that work and live around these uh, in the communities. Um, so if we could go to the last poll question, throw that up, and then maybe we'll do a couple of uh, questions from the attendees. So uh, this question, pretty straightforward. Are you currently utilizing real-time air quality monitoring? If you could uh, 
answer that. And in the meantime, we have a question for you, Meredith. Um, what value does PDC Energy get from 24 seven monitoring of methane if done voluntarily for the OGMP? Um, and can you provide some specifics? Sure. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with the oil and gas methane partnership, but it is a um, partnership between United Nations um, Environmental Defense Fund and then operators along with the climate action group. I'm forgetting their name. And um, so basically it's a great opportunity for PDC. We have set methane intensity reduction targets here over the next five to 10 years with, you know, that goal of getting closer and closer to zero. And so it's a, it's a way to, to, to lend credibility to that, right? The UNEP uh, reviews all our monitoring data and, and, you know, determines kind of the validity of it. And we're, there's many, there's different levels within um, the OGMP and the goal is you need to get to the fifth level, which is site level monitoring and then a reconciliation between direct measurement, like uh, um, whatever that could be using a monitor for direct measurement as well. And so you have to reconcile site level. And so we're looking at 24 seven methane monitors for that site level piece. And it wouldn't be independent of other options as well. And there you are reconciling your um, direct measurement information. And there's that opportunity to see what the overall methane flux is at a facility. And then what you're doing in a direct measurement, like what you're submitting to subpart W, or in our case, we also submit methane and um, other greenhouse gases to the state every year through a Colorado emissions inventory. And so seeing the mm -hmm. reconciliation between what our direct measurements are and then what the overall site level can lend insight into and knowing there's error bars in both types of measurement, especially right now with all the emerging technology. And then, you know, seeing if maybe our direct measurement is too high, like um, we have a better opportunity to get better measurement data to kind of refine that. Or maybe we're potentially missing an emission source, though in Colorado, I, I find that unlikely, but you never know. Um, and, and, and trying to figure out that so that we can really work towards reducing that bad methane flux from applications. And those monitors also work great. They all have weather vanes and you can also pinpoint, um, they work just like any other um, leak detection too. So it can pinpoint within a certain area. Like we know that we're, the monitor is picking up something at a tank, for example, and we can send someone right, right out there and they can pinpoint Point, the location for a tank. Some of the monitors can get even more detailed than that. Like they can find the specific thief hatch or pressure relief valve from where there could potentially be a leak. So there's definitely different ways to use it, but that's kind of the OGMP requirement. And we found it, we found it pretty ha helpful too. Um, we've modified some of our um, uh, methodologies out there as a result of what some of our monitors are seeing. Even if it's not something that's triggering a threshold, we have been much lower internal thresholds that we also look at so that we can refine our operations and, and continue to reduce any kinds of emissions that we have at our site. Nope, you're muted, Pat. Sorry, we had a delivery here in the office. Thank you, Matt. Um, let's go back to the poll question and see the results. If it, ah, about a third right now are involved currently using real-time air quality monitoring. I was going to guess 50-50. Um, I imagine over the years those, uh, those ratios will, will change. Um, again, any questions you have, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, I have one here for Michael. Uh, you mentioned technologies rapidly advancing and changing. Um, you know, what have you seen as the biggest advancement uh, within the environmental space in terms of monitoring? You know, it's a tough question. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, I think I think for us, one of the things that we're really interested in is um, speciated uh, VTEX. Um, so we are piloting, um, testing some of that out um, to see how it works. Um, in West, when I say speciated VTEX, I mean kind of um, in like a, a lower uh, form without as much uh, requirement for something like a GC or more expensive instrumentation, something that's relatively low cost that can accurately, um, you know, identify um, VTEX compounds. Um, it's a significant concern for us with the, a lot of the oil and gas activity. Um, 
and um, from some of Meredith's comments, um, trying to use uh, total VOCs to identify and, and correlate to BTEX, I think it's something that industry is concerned about as well. Um, so as we as we look through um, different technologies, that's one that we're um, we'll be piloting and, and testing out um, side by side with um, things like GCs and other uh, instrumentation that we know can accurately measure BTEX. Is that optical equipment, Michael? For it's a better question for my very technical team. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and you know, we use the GCs, and we're starting to work with some UV equipment for that as well. Um, question for Meredith. Let's see how we're doing on time. Got a few more minutes. Um, and, I, you know, I think Reg 7 is unique, and maybe if you could uh, walk folks through that. Um, do you have to monitor for methane as well? Are there a state or EPA regulations as well as local? Um, um, so it, the focus for Regulation 7 is, is monitoring. You can choose whether your, um, your option is methane or VOCs. We've, we've selected VOCs. Um, there's no federal requirement at this time to do continuous monitoring of methane. I mean, I think there's a lot of flurry in the air that could change here. Um, but in Colorado, that is, it's basically just kind of, you know, a little bit past fence line monitoring to make sure we're just, you know, there aren't emissions. Um, you know, we can permit emissions, but then beyond emissions that might be larger or some indicate a malfunction or something like that. And so uh, we are not required to monitor methane um, unless you opt into that through Regulation 7. Like I said, PDC has opted for VOCs. All our methane monitoring that we're currently piloting and we'll be doing, at least in the near future, will be voluntary. Yeah, I think it's, you know, and I've never seen this in any other, by any other regulatory body, but you can, Reg, Reg 7 says you can monitor for methane, total VOCs, or benzene uh, if you opted to do that and the operator gets to choose. And I don't know, Michael, maybe you know, but I think it almost 100% are monitoring for total VOC. Is that your understanding? So it is the vast majority. Um, I, I don't think it's all of them, um, but, but certainly the vast majority are using total VOCs. Um, and having been on the Air Quality Control Commission when that rule was passed, I think a lot of our thought at the time was to allow for flexibility and really push the envelope in uh, you know, detecting and measuring all three of those, right? Um, you know, methane monitoring is technology is getting better and hopefully it'll it'll get even better and they'll be able to use that in some of the reg seven total voc obviously we've um pushed the envelope and a lot of um changes in some of that technology and different vendors coming on and utilizing that data in different ways um so we'll revisit that regulation here um i believe in 2024 and update it um to make sure that we are employing the latest um, technology available um, and, and getting better and better data out from uh, the regulation that we can then use to inform future decision making. Yeah, and continuous benzene is a tricky one because there really isn't good technology for continuous benzene at this time. And so, you know, we're using those passive samplers for benzene that you collect. And then if there were, if we were to trigger a, a threshold, um, we actually deploy SUMA canisters as well. So we get that speciation data as well. But there's definitely room for improvement in that speciation, which is what Michael was speaking to. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, we're pretty much at the top of the hour. Um, 12.59. Any last thoughts from the panel before we kind of sign out. Michael, you were able to successfully do this in the lobby of a hotel, so nice work. <laughs> Thank you. I had my yeah. doubts at the beginning, I'm not gonna lie. You know, I think, um, you know, for me, I think, you know, the, the future of air monitoring is changing very, very quickly. Um, I think there's a lot of new companies coming on who are developing new technologies. Um, many people are trying those out and figuring out how to best utilize those, including regulatory agencies. Um, so I think looking forward, it's um, really interesting and exciting what um, technology companies are developing. Um, really looking forward to testing some of those out and then implementing them in ways that 
um, produce good data that we can then use for rulemakings or uh, you know identifying you know potential areas that we hadn't hadn't done monitoring in the past. So I think it's really an exciting time. Yeah, no, it definitely is. A lot of cool stuff happening and very impactful stuff. Most importantly, um, you know, I'm just Matt, Michael, Meredith. Um, I think the four of us can sit around and do this all day if people let us. Um, <laughs> we love talking about this stuff. So thank you. Definitely appreciate your time. Um, everybody who attended, thank you for your time. I'm sure people have meetings at the top of the hour. They probably have to jump to um, before we go. Jess, uh, anything from Environment and Energy? I uh, just want to thank the panel for for being here today. Really enjoyed listening, you know, to the discussions that we had. And just a reminder to all attendees that you can still submit questions even post live event if something comes to mind after the fact after we uh, wrap up. And uh, we just want to thank you guys for being here today. So looking forward to working with the team at Montrose again soon. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.